millions of people around the world have witnessed UFOs. Millions have undergone some bizarre experience. From tunnels of light to out-of-body experiences, from alien abduction to visions of unearthly apparitions. Millions more remain silent through fear of being ridiculed. The fact is, what modern man is experiencing is not new. In fact, it has been going on for millennia. The various recorded histories of the world reveals the truth. We are told about the experience. We are given the knowledge of amazing machinery. We are even given the names of those ancient gods who gave humanity incredible knowledge. We know them today as the Watchers. They came. They taught humanity art, culture, architecture, agriculture and science. They became masters over mankind and a hybrid race was born. But all was not well in Eden and a great battle ensued. This is the incredible story of mankind's ancient past and its link to the millions of alien related stories in our modern era. This is the story of the great lights that descended from the sky and watched over mankind. This is the history of the alien watchers, the ancient gods. They are the sons of God, the Irim in Hebrew. They are governed by the biblical Elohim, which means the shining ones, the great lights from the sky. Zechariah Sitchin, in his book The Stairway to Heaven, stated, The Akkadians called their predecessors Shumerians and spoke of the land of Shumer. It was in fact the biblical land of Shinar. It was the land whose name literally meant the land of the watchers. It was indeed the Egyptian Tarneta, land of the watchers, the land from which gods had come to Egypt. So, Sumeria means land of the watchers, and it is from this land that the Elohim, or shining ones, who governed the watchers, also came. In the origin of consciousness in the breakdown of the bicameral mind, Julian Jaynes tells us something interesting about these governing gods. Throughout Mesopotamia, from the earliest times of Sumer and Akkad, all lands were owned by gods and men were their slaves. Of this, the cuneiform texts leave no doubt whatever. Each city-state had its principal god, and the king was described in the very earliest documents that we have as the tenant farmer of the god. We need to take a look at these Elohim for a moment to find out who these gods were that supposedly enslaved men and were in charge of the Watchers. Elohim is the term used in the Old Testament for the Lord, an incorrect usage as the term is plural and means shining ones. We can see this plurality in the text from Genesis 1.26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And again in Genesis 6.2, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. This term, sons of God, is literally sons of gods and comes from Ben Ha Elohim sons of the Shining Ones. These were the sons of those shining lights that descended to Earth. 
The Sumerian word El means simply bright or shining. The Old Irish Eilil means shining. Old Cornish El means shining. Elf means shining, and hence we have elves as tall, mysterious, angelic beings. The Inca term Illa is bright or to shine. The Babylonian Elu is to shine. These are just a few that have sprung up worldwide from the same Sumerian source. This itself reveals the vast spread of these sons of God or shining ones, the lights from the sky, and their influence to this day in all our cultures. Baal, the deity often spoken of as the Lord in the Bible, is also seen as a shining one in the Old Testament and is called the Owner. At that time, there were many owners or shining ones. In fact, there was one for each village, as if gathering of humanity needed watching over. To the Hebrews, the Elohim were nature divinities from ancient Sumerian times. According to General Albert Pike, the famous Masonic historian, in his work Morals and Dogma, the Elohim were the host of heaven ascending and descending to pass messages to and from God. Some of the Shining Ones were termed Watchers, and are akin to the angels of the Lord. Yahweh Elohim means simply leader of the shining ones. The great God of Christianity, Judaism and Islam is in fact the leader of the lights that descended from the sky. So now we have these plural Elohim, or Shining Ones, as gods, being above even the kings and supplying watchers to watch over man. The Egyptian Tarneta that Sitchin mentions resembles the Egyptian Neta, a name for Tar and other gods, which means guardian or watcher. Tarneta is also the name for the Red Sea Straits, which connected Mesopotamia and Egypt, and is known as the Place of the Gods. These watchers were also known as Urshu, and were classed as being less divine than the gods. The ancients spoke of a time when there were gods, or shining ones, who ruled up and down Sumeria and Egypt, and who employed watchers over the ordinary folk. In the same way a pharaoh of Egypt was a god on earth, so too priests of the Elohim were the shining lights on earth. The Egyptian Book of the Dead calls these watchers Anubis and Horus in the form of Horus the Sightless. Others, however, say that they are the Chacha, who bring to naught the operations of their knives, and others say that they are the chiefs of the Sheniu chamber. So, even in ancient Egypt, by the time of the writing of the Book of the Dead, there was confusion. They had to come to Egypt, the Egyptians wrote, from Tar Ur, the far or foreign land, whose name Ur meant oldest, but could also have been the actual place name, a place well known from Mesopotamian and biblical records, the ancient city of Ur. We should note at this point that this Ur is the same place that the father of the world's three great religions, Abraham, is also said to have trained.
He was trained by the Shining Ones, the Watchers, the great lights from the sky. And he started the yoke of mainstream religion on this planet. On the other side of the world, it appears the Shining Ones and Watchers also descended. According to the legend of Votan from Mesoamerica, this Votan was the serpent who was a descendant of the race of Khan and was a guardian or watcher, amazingly similar to Canaan. These Canaanites are implicated in many places revolving around the Shining Ones and the original serpent priests. From this time onwards, serpent worship spread across the globe and we have to wonder why. The serpent was known in the language of Canaan variously as Aub, Ab, Ob, Ob, Of, Op, F, Ev. In the Mayan language, Kan also means serpent, as in Kukulkan, the bird serpent, and just as in the ancient Sumerian, Akan, and the Scottish, Kan, for serpent, which is where we get the word canny, like the wise snake. Vulcan, the Roman god of fire, comes from the Babylonian can for serpent and vol for fire, showing an etymological link across thousands of miles and oceans and meaning, therefore, that Vulcan is the shining serpent. Indeed, even the very centre of the Christian world, the Vatican, comes from the words Vatis for prophet and Can for serpent, making the Vatican a place of serpent prophecy, the place where the word of the Shining Ones was spoken and disseminated around the world. Little wonder that their Christian deity, Jesus, rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. The Hebrews termed these watchers as nun reshayin, meaning those who watch. In the Greek, this translated as gigantes or giants, a race that even the writer Hesiod featured as being monstrous. Now we can understand the role of the giants seen across the world of folklore as the presence of the watchers. In the first book of Enoch, chapter 20, verses 1 to 8, even gives us the names of these watchers. And these are the names of the holy angels who watch. Uriel, one of the holy angels who is over the world and over Tartarus. Raphael, one of the holy angels who is over the spirits of men. Raguel, one of the holy angels who takes vengeance on the world of the luminaries. Michael, one of the holy angels, to wit, he that is set over the best part of mankind and over chaos. Sarakil, one of the holy angels, who is set over the spirits who sin in spirit. Gabriel, one of the holy angels, who is over paradise and the serpents and the cherubim. Remiel, one of the holy angels whom God set over those who rise. Note that Gabriel, the messenger who told of the birth of Jesus and who passed on wisdom to Muhammad, is in charge of the serpents. Remiel is over those who rise, those seeking enlightenment. Enoch actually wrote about them, and in fact, for them, 
in the Book of Enoch. In the Bible and the Book of Enoch, these shining ones are called angels, archangels or cherubim. Unless the literature is purely apocryphal, we find that in the Bible, the angel figures are simply earthly men. The word angel means messenger. In Cornish, as in the Semite languages, the word El means angel and the shining one. In the Bible, we do not find angels with wings. There are no original stories of them being supernatural. They are, in fact, quite ordinary. It is always Gabriel who informs the people of a coming special childbirth. A doctor, maybe, involved in what many say was the hybridization of the human race with the aliens. Michael is the warrior and protector accompanied by angels wielding fiery swords. Each and every one of them has their own specific duty. People with titles, angelic titles, as messengers and ambassadors of the Shining Ones. The title, Cherubim, means exiles and could be an indication of the origins of these angels exiled from their own homeland or even planet. Enoch, the consecrated one, would later write up the history of these fallen angels who spread across the globe as the great shining ones, teaching, measuring and building the world's most mysterious ancient monuments. Of course, we must not forget the seraphim of Numbers 21.6 and elsewhere. These mystical beings have hands, a face, legs and great powers from God because they are in the light. They have symbolic wings, meaning they could fly. Their name means shining ones or fiery serpents. They are enlightened beings. Mystical Jewish literature tells us that the angels can fly, tell the future, shapeshift, speak Hebrew, and are emanations of the divine shining light. In the Old Testament, God is indistinguishable from the angel or messenger known as Yahweh. He looks the same and acts as his representative there is no difference here from Babylonian and Egyptian records. In fact, the stories are similar across the world. In the New Testament, the angels actually take part in the judgment at the end times. Is this an indication that one day they shall return? When they do, it appears they will judge mankind. Looks like we failed. We are also told about the Nephilim, or Watchers. These are the angels who seem to have been the military arm of the Shining Ones, and those who were initially employed to guard the Garden of Eden, but then began to mix with the indigenous peoples of the area. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Semjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, 
Let us all swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual invocations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together, and bound themselves by mutual invocations upon it. Book of Enoch, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. And then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from heaven and saw much blood being shed upon the earth, and all lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. Book of Enoch, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. These insurgents also passed on knowledge and taught them combat and how to make weapons. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them, and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all colouring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray, and became corrupt in all their ways. Semjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings, Amaras the resolving of enchantments, Barakijal taught astrology, Cockabel the constellations, Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds, Arakil, the signs of the earth, Shamshiel, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. Book of Enoch, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. All this was seen as a violation against the laws laid down by the Shining Ones, who were possessive in their knowledge. Thou seest what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. And Semjaza, to whom thou hast given authority to bear rule over his associates, and they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth, and have slept with the women, and have defiled themselves, and revealed to them all kinds of sin. And the women have borne giants, and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. Book of Enoch, chapter 9, verses 6 to 10. Enoch, a scribe who was taught by the Shining Ones, was then employed as a messenger or intermediary between the Shining Ones and these Fallen Ones, who had decided to abandon their divinity to live amongst the tribes of man. Enoch was then sent to tell the insurgents that a severe sentence had been passed on them and that they were soon to be punished. In brief, the punishment sent is the flood. It is as if the Shining Ones wanted to wash away the sins of the earth that had been created by their own kind, the Fallen Ones. In the Testament of Amram, we have a remarkable insight into the aspect of these Shining Watchers. I asked them, Who are you, that you are thus empowered over me? They answered me, We have been empowered and rule over all mankind. They said to me, Which of us do you choose to rule you? I raised my eyes and looked. One of them was terrifying in his appearance, like a serpent, his cloak many-coloured, yet very dark. And I looked again, and in his appearance, his visage that like a viper, and wearing exceedingly, and all his eyes. I replied to him, This watcher, so is he? He answered me, This watcher, and his three names are Belial, and Prince of Darkness, 
and king of evil. So the Watchers looked like the serpent and had many eyes. Not something of this earth. The Mosaic Book of Jubilees was originally called the Apocalypse of Moses, as it was supposedly written by Moses while on Mount Sinai and dictated by a Watcher or angel. This book was intended as a history of the days of old and reveals the purpose of the Watchers. For in his days the angels of the Lord descended upon the earth, those who are named Watchers, that they should instruct the children of men that they should do judgment and uprightness upon the earth. These watchers, according to the Book of Jubilees, are the sons of God spoken of in Genesis, sent from their heavenly abode to instruct men. What seems to have occurred is that they fell from grace by mating with the daughters of men and were thus outcast giving us the fallen angels we are familiar with today. However, according to a dictionary of angels, not all these watchers descended from the heavenly abode, and those that did not were termed holy watchers, residing in the fifth heaven. As Enoch himself had testified against these fallen watchers, he was protected by the ruling Shining Ones and transported to the Garden of Eden. Eden means plateau and is therefore a specific place. And I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of Majesty and the King of the Ages. And lo, the watchers called me, Enoch the scribe, and said to me, Enoch, thou scribe of righteousness, go, Declare to the watchers of the heaven who have left the high heaven, the holy eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women, and have done as the children of the earth do, and have taken unto themselves wives. Ye have wrought great destruction on the earth, and ye shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And inasmuch as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity, but mercy and peace ye shall not attain. 1 Enoch 10 verses 3 to 8. According to Andrew Collins in his book, From the Ashes of Angels, The Forbidden Legacy of a Fallen Race, the fallen watchers swear an oath and bind themselves together. The place of this action is called Ardis, the fabled summit of Mount Hermon, which derives from the Hebrew word for curse. Following these actions of the fallen watchers, the Shining Ones called down a great flood upon the earth to destroy the offspring, and Noah is warned to build a great ship to escape the impending doom. There was obviously some great battle between the dissenters and the Shining Ones, and the loyal watchers, which allowed Michael, Gabriel, and the others to slay the remaining fallen watchers. The flood is the symbolic idea of the later cleansing of the land and the restarting of the human race on track with the Shining One's ideals, a probable merging of a folk memory of some great catastrophe and the actual event. There were other catastrophes written up as being the judgment of the remaining watchers, which must simply be folk memories of actual catastrophes that occurred and were blamed upon the transgressions of the fallen watchers. Indeed, even the spirits of these fallen watchers are blamed for future evils, as Enoch points out. And the spirits of the giants afflict oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger and thirst and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women, because they have preceded them. 1 Enoch 12, 
Notable revelations admitted by the watchers to the sons of man were knowledge of the signs of the earth, writing, meteorology, geography, and geodesy, all implying that these shining ones understood the energy and power of the earth and its electromagnetism, not to mention the movements of the planets. There are many fables of these times from across the world of great builders architects and magicians all relating entirely back to these Shining Ones origins. We can see the similarity in the structures of Europe and elsewhere of the burial mounds with the fact that one of the fallen watchers, Azazel, was cast into the desert where they placed upon him rough and jagged rocks. Much of this myth of the watchers is found to be within the tales of wars and merging of peoples across the Middle East between Canaanites, Egyptians, Sumerians and even Asian civilizations. But the underlying current is the belief in the Shining Ones as leaders with watchers doing their bidding, evolving into God with his angelic beings. The terms Anunnaki, Anakim, and even Nephilim mean those who came down to earth from heaven and is a reference to their position and location on the plateau of Eden. They looked down on the people below and watched, something that would sound very familiar to thousands of people around the world today who have experienced alien visitations. They represented the sun, moon, and planets on Earth. The truth of the story of the Shining Ones and their watchers has been the subject of a purging by many Jewish authorities, who were, understandably, concerned that the myth of these angels and their worship would distract people from the worship of the One God. To this end, the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, mentioned previously, were stricken from the accepted list and are now known as Apocrypha. What we do know, though, is that these watchers continued in what has been described as the underground stream and were called egregors. They somehow bred with humanity and melted away. Very soon, massive secret societies emerged that fostered the original teachings of the Shining Ones. The Kabbalah named 72 national angelic regions, which the Hebrews call Elohim, or Shining Ones. The metaphysical technical term egregors is also used for them. Derived from the Greek word egreos, it means watcher or guardian. The office of a watcher is to protect from outside pressures a region or ethnic group assigned to its care. The region is always measured off from another posing a threat of some sort to it. A given group of persons is tied to a certain area of jurisdiction. Here too, we meet the riddle of the founding of cities and states. What is more, both the ancient Romans and quite recently the Chinese have recognized the existence of guardian spirits set over cities. Indeed, one author reports as follows on the occult war waged on enemy cities by ancient Rome. The Romans, when besieging a city, made a habit of carefully inquiring the name of the city and of its guardian spirit. When they knew these, they would summon the guardian spirit of the city and its inhabitants and conquer it. Egregor is Greek and means to rouse from sleep, be excited by passion, to be awake or to watch. Incredibly etymologically linked to the enlightenment experience of the awakening or the place between awake and asleep. It is this very place between awake and asleep that the vast majority of alien abductions occur. 
The root of the word egregor appears to be the Syrian ear or er and reverts to watcher and is also related to Ur, the home of Abraham. Eliphas Levi, a 19th century magician and mystic, speaks of these egregors on numerous occasions and even links them to the giants or watchers spoken of in the Book of Enoch, saying that they take shape and have appeared in the guise of giants. These are the egregors of the Book of Enoch, termed the celestial watchers or egregors by the ancients. Levi also calls these egregors the Anakim, shining ones, men of renown, the giants of the Bible, and that they are expressed in the myths of various cultures, just as we have been finding. It therefore appears that Levi knew of these egregors or watchers from the recently translated and widely available Book of Enoch. Levi was well known to have Rosigrusian tendencies, and this movement too was aware of the meaning of the word. In fact, they believed that the egregors were still in existence and were working in the background. Amazingly, the infamous book, the Necronomicon, tells us about a fabulous city of Irim. Irim of the Pillars is part of Arabian magical lore and was built by the jinn or angels and were also watchtowers, the towers of the watchers. The pillars were built on the instructions of the lords of the tribe of Ad, which means eternity, who is referred to in Hebrew terms as the plural Nephilim, the giants or watchers of the Shining Ones, and referred to in the Book of Enoch as Erim. According to Arabian legend, this Erim is located in Rub al-Khali, which means the empty quarter or the void. The void could be a real barren location or a term for the space between. Is this a clue to the method of transportation? Archaeologists have identified the very spot of this infamous Irim as being the lost city of Ubar. One further link with Enoch to the mysteries of the modern alchemists, mystics and seers is seen in the 13th century text of A. Bar Hebraeus, who spent many years investigating the ancient texts at the library of Maraga and gives us this unique insight. The ancient Greeks say that Enoch is Harmis Trismagostis. The chronography of Bar Hebraeus, translated by E. W. Budge, 1932. This is none other and Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes, whom all mystics hold in high esteem as having passed down ancient and profound secrets and who is seen as the father of almost all Western secret orders. Whether or not the actual Shining Ones, Watchers or Egregor were actually physically around during this vast expanse of time is still the subject of debate. But what this does show is that the ancient influence of the Shining Ones was certainly still in existence. Even the Thesaurus Temporum, translated into Latin in the mid-17th century, gives us a chronology of events surrounding these egregors. In 1000 they descended, and by 1487 BC they had taken Enoch to Paradise due to the descent of the fallen watchers. A text from the 17th century that clearly states that the watchers descended, remained on earth and even took Enoch away again. It seems then that the extremely ancient concept and story of the Shining Ones was still very much alive and being propagated secretly by the mystics of the last few hundred years. These were part and parcel of their hidden secrets. The question arises, why did they feel the need to hide such secrets? Today, the egregor is seen in occult circles as an energy form, 
which according to the Martinist order of the Knights of Christ, who claim to be the heirs of the Rosicrucians and others, say its goal is to set the human being free from the hold of the Prince of the World and of achieving the mystical union of the self-aware personality with the individual profundity. Its members strive to have access to mastery by reuniting with the kingdom of the center, propitious with the descent of the paraclet sent by Christ in addition to the assistance rendered by the attachment on the side of the initiator with the egregory, protector of the secret chain. An apolistic succession of power, suggests John Michael Greer in Inside a Magical Lodge, is a basic function of the egregor. Worship me, cries the egregora. I am the son of God. You are nothing but a worthless and sinful creature, damned from birth and destined to hell were it not for my sacrifice. And without me, you will never reach heaven. The egregory is a group spirit that serves to remind the initiate of his or her goals. It informs and guides the individual and it protects the living chain of brotherhood. The living chain of brotherhood is entered into when a session performs a rite of their own creation intended to protect and enhance the temple of Set. The egregory protects the brotherhood by letting them know that their enemies are there. A symbolic representation of the egregory is used to maintain a link to the Prince of Darkness. Sir Osmond IV, Saturnian Principles. One of the peculiar archaeological evidences we have of ancient watchers are the round towers. What was being watched is a matter of some debate. It may have been the people, or it may have been the stars. Indeed, it is highly likely they were built for both, as well as for the search for aggressors. The Great Pyramid of Giza was seen as a gateway to the stars. In his paper, The Great Pyramid Texts, Gleason Harvey points out that in the pyramids of Shakara, there are more than 3,000 columns of text from the 5th and 6th dynasties, which he believes holds the secret to the pyramid's use. These texts include incantations and magical formulae that used to be invoked in certain locations around the pyramid, but in the upper passage, chamber, gallery and shaft is an incredibly old, unmistakable megalithic glyph. This glyph or phrase translates remarkably into star door and tunnel opening gate. Because glyphs are sadly lacking from most pyramids, this information is a startling discovery. Egyptologists claim that the star is mythological and leave it at that. But could this really be the case? With all the information about ancient watchers having descended to Earth, we have to wonder. We already know that the Egyptians called Giza Lostal, which means gateway to the other world. What is this other world? If this were truly a gateway to another world, then how did it work? Back in the 1970s and 80s, a scientist named Joe Parr decided it was time to take a look at the Great Pyramid and pyramid shapes in general, and what he discovered is completely amazing. In his experiments, Joe set up an aligned pyramid north, south and east, west, with flat coils placed in the north and south. A blown, one microfarad capacitor was sparked across the gap using a battery, resistor and chart recorder. This was to simulate the electromagnetic energy of the Earth passing over the pyramid. The scientists registered the changes on a daily basis, recording the state of an energy bubble that surrounded the pyramid. Strangely, the energy actually stopped all kinds of radiation, 
and the bubble showed attenuation to beta emitters, ion sources and magnetic sources when in the bubble. Feeding negative ions into the bubble actually intensified the energy. The energy was also found to alter over the course of the year and 13 years of experimentation gave good results. Most peculiar was the effect upon gravity, which is linked intrinsically to electromagnetic radiation. It appeared that the bubble actually blocked out the force of gravity as well as electromagnetic energy, showing a 113,000 times increase in kinetic energy, leading the researchers to theorize that the pyramid actually moved in time and space, a place known to theoretical physicists as H-space. But what relevance could this have on our work here? Could the Great Pyramid actually be a massive transport device? Whether to physically travel or mentally to another place, another world? And the fact is, the Great Pyramid never did contain a body. No evidence of a pharaoh was ever discovered. Nothing. But there must be more evidence of ancient buildings with this peculiar inbuilt design. There is. One peculiar and little written about structure is the round tower. These are worldwide in the hundreds and strangely are linked to the mysteries of serpent worship in almost every instance. Tall, elegant, round structures built by cultures as diverse as the Irish Celts and early Christians to the Hopi Indians and Egyptians, all of which are linked with serpent worship. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to towers protected by angels or watchers. In the famous Qumran community of the Dead Sea Scroll, the war between the sons of light and the sons of darkness is to be conducted with acute awareness of the place of the angelic world in it. The Qumran War Scroll even gives us details on the battle formations, which involve four towers that are units of soldiers with specifically long spears and shields. On each of the shields is written the name of one of the four archangels. This links the round towers or watchtowers to the watchers or giants. In Ireland, there are over 65 round towers many more than 100 feet tall. And there are a great many legends of giants and watchers in Ireland. In fact, the ancient history of Ireland is awash with lords of light who descended upon the land and nobody knows where from. Gradwell, writing in the 19th century, pointed out that St. Patrick and his followers almost invariably selected those sacred sites of paganism and built their wooden churches under the shadow of the round towers, then as mysterious and inscrutable as they are today. Some claim these structures were fire temples dedicated to sun worship, and it is easy to see why when we discover that sun worship is connected to serpent worship and the Enlightenment experience. Others claim them to be watchtowers which would relate nicely to the ancient term for the serpent cult as watchers. In fact, Hargrave Jennings, author of Ophiolatreia, relates them to the obelisk, that ancient serpent-derived pillar to the heavens. The towers are also found close to rivers, streams and holy wells. The water was the subterranean home of the serpent race and was often seen as the entrance to the other world. But it is the association with water that seems to be important to such structures in terms of Earth electromagnetic energy. There may be an important link between round towers and the Phoenicians, who had similar structures dedicated to their rain and water deity, Baal. There are thousands of these towers scattered across Sardinia, just north of the Phoenician capital of Carthage, dating to at least 2,000 years before Christ. 
there are also those who believe that these towers served as astronomical tools, similar to Stonehenge, and this may be the case also. The tower in Iran, called Radkan, which means serpent, is thought to be one of these, and like the European towers of a much later date, it has a conical cap. In the Naga, or Serpent Homeland of India, the round tower became the stupa, and in China, the pagoda, both other forms of round tower. In Feng Shui, we get a glimpse of the real use of the towers. The pagoda, and indeed the stupa, are thought to trap negative energy, or qi, known as dragon or serpent energy, what we would call the negative ions. Remember that these negative ions in the Pa pyramid experiments were thought to cause anti-gravity and anti-electromagnetic effects. The very tale of Lady Whitesnake is popular all over the world and is ultimately due to this electromagnetic energy. It is the Lady Whitesnake, or Lunar Snake, that is trapped in the pagoda for a thousand years. Trapping the massive energy of the Earth's magnetic field in a structure. Further round towers can be found as far away as Southern America, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Chichen Itza, Africa and many more. All are related to the serpent energy and serpent cult and many have the same astronomical alignments. Indeed, the Hopi snake tribe actually refer to them as snake houses. The Hopi god of death and the underworld is Masau, and he has to explain to the snake mother why her children cannot live in the house. And Masau said, no, the snakes have no houses. Because they have bitten and killed Hopi, they should never again have a house but should live under rocks and in holes in the ground. But he also said the snake houses, the round towers, which were built for them should never again be destroyed and that all coming generations of people should know the snake's doom, never again to have a house. Could this be an indication of the death of the snake cult? Could this be the Hopi version of St. Patrick's story in Ireland? And if so, then it relates back to Ireland, where, again, there are hundreds of round towers connected with the serpent. Is this a remnant of some battle that ensued between humanity and those who worshipped the serpent, the Shining Ones, the Watchers? If it is the case that these round towers or snake houses are seen across the Atlantic with the same religious and cultural grounding, then it is also true to state that the Anakim are also related in some way. Anak means long neck or necklaces. The Hopi too have a similar word, Anak, meaning necklace or earring. It is also an expression used when in pain from snake bite. But what about the science of the round towers? Is there anything that can be related to the energy discussed with the pyramids? In the book, Ancient Mysteries, Modern Visitors, Professor Callahan relays his research, which amazingly shows that the round towers may have been designed as huge resonance systems for collecting and storing meter-long wavelengths of magnetic and electromagnetic energy. Basing the hypothesis of his work on insect antennae and the capacity to resonate electromagnetic waves, Callahan hypothesized that the tall round towers were made to be the earth antennae and that similar buildings or structures around the globe could have been made for the same reason. He believed that this energy would be passed on to those meditating at the site. Of the towers tested in Ireland, Callahan found that the iron-rich rock that they were made from indeed helped this effect along. The towers made from other materials, such as limestone and granite, were still paramagnetic. Callahan 
goes on to show how the rubble within these towers, which has baffled people for decades, was truly there as a tuning implement. In the same way, I say the plugs in the air vents of the Great Pyramid are tuning plugs. What we can see here is the extent of the influence of the first origins of secret societies, both in culture and texts, but also in the many fascinating and mysterious archaeological remains of the world. These shining ones are the first on paper. They have a structure and a basis of authority. They rule over man and are all wise, having their watchers to ensure that their instructions are carried out. Either the Shining Ones are still in power now, generations later, or the secret societies of the globe have copied the methods, structure and symbol of these first few. The great religions of the world have all been created by some secret method. The early Christians met in secrecy and spread the word of Christ far and wide whilst the orthodox religions and powers of the day struggled to rout them out. The same is true of Islam. Power then is derived from control of the masses and here in Sumeria control was formed by those who possessed great knowledge, wisdom and a seeming ability to access God. This has always been the lure of secret orders and also that of orthodox religion. One is open, one is not. The texts and the archaeology reveal to us stories of strange looking serpent like humans that descended to earth, took control of mankind, created civilization, instructed humanity and even bred with them. We see glimpses of a catastrophe or battle and the ascent again of these beings back to their other world. But these hybrid men and women, formed from a union of alien stock and earthly humanity, remained. They would go on to become the kings and queens of society. Their bloodline was so special, so divine, that they could not breed again outside of their own and their lineage had to be defended at all costs. The blood of aliens walks upon this earth to this day and those behind the scenes of power know all too well.